the internet. Welcome to the Revolver Fan First podcast, where we go deep with artists into their history as a fan. Today, we have Keith Buckley of Every Time I Die. Welcome. So, who was the first artist you put on a pedestal? First artist I put on a pedestal, um, me personally, where I felt like whoever was writing the songs was kind of speaking to me in a way that I didn't understand was Tears for Fears. Um, all of my childhood fantasies about music and going to concerts and having music in my life revolved around Tears for Fears. Like when I was, you know, under 10 years old, I forget what song I was listening to, but I had this idea that Tears for Fears are going to one day play a birthday party of mine. So I would spend hours daydreaming about Tears for Fears playing my birthday party and who I would invite to my birthday party. And who do I think at, you know, 10 years old appreciates Tears for Fears? Like, who would even know that that's a big deal? Um, so they were the first people I put on the pedestal. Yes. And then Eddie Vedder was the first artist that I was like, oh, okay, he's talking to me. Like, more than just the sounds setting a vibe that makes sense with my personal vibe, uh, Eddie Vedder is talking to me in a language I understand. Did you ever write back? I can oh. No, but what I did realize, I think, um, you know, Eddie Vedder introduced me to the world of lyrics as poetry. Um, and then I sort of chased that mm. everywhere I went, sort of looking for lyricists that were poets. Yeah. Uh, you know, that led me to like <laughs> County Crows, uh, Tori Amos, Bjork, Radiohead. Um, because they had a poetic, we'll just say singer, but they also had a really good vibe and the, the, the spirit of the music really like, I loved it. It just sat, it sat with me perfectly. So um, yeah, I, I always just spent my life really trying to find out, you know, aside from just the music making me feel some type of way, does do the lyrics, do I connect with the lyrics? You know? yeah. And even if I can't connect with them, can I read them as a fan of literature? Yeah. Yeah. Do they stand alone on their own merit sort of thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yours, yours definitely do. Like, I, lo I, like, I love yep. reading lyric. Okay, they're not lyric book lists anymore. They're lyric, they're lyric website pages. Sadly, yeah, yeah. no longer a lyric book booklet. But there's something about that, like, okay, so after Paul German, you're discovering all these lyricists. What was the first musical storyline that really was super vivid for you after that? Wow, good question. Um, well, I realized that um, musicians were divinity and I was a listener, so I was not divinity, but I wanted to be around and as close to that as I could. And it never occurred to me to just try to be one. Uh, I was just going to be a devout follower of music you know it was going to be my religion and that was just what I was meant to do somehow I just knew that my destiny was in in sound somehow you know what I mean yeah. it just it, it was in sound um so yeah I, I I started a band I mean when I was like 13 or 14 just getting yeah. some kids together and playing punk Nirvana rock covers. Nirvana covers yeah, played Nirvana covers. Yep, yep. Um, and we you know we wrote our own stuff, which looking back, uh, at the time it felt very natural and necessary and exciting. And I look back at it now, and I'm like, I was fucking 14 years old when I was writing lyrics, and I think of my child who just turned six yesterday. You know, that's eight more years can I imagine her writing lyrics that she would have to account for later in her life? You know what I mean? It's strange to me that I was doing that so young, but yeah, we were doing it. And so um, what I realized was that there was this pantheon of divine musicians, you know, and that would include obviously Mozart and Bach and, and, and the actual musicians. Then there were the pop culture musicians. And then there was, um, there was us, there was us, just the normal people that were just down there and trying to figure out how we 
related to it. Um, but I discovered that there was something called the hardcore scene. And it was where a bunch of people went to watch other musicians who weren't divinity, who weren't on that, that untouchable tier. They were peers and they were people that were my age and they were like me. And so I found the hardcore scene. I was like, this is my tribe. This is where I belong. This is it. This is where I belong. This is what I was made for. Everything that has ever been of value in my life has come out of that hardcore scene. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, since, since that, you know, yeah, not necessarily before that, but, um, so yeah, so I, I, I really feel like it was, um, becoming a part of that scene and going to see bands and going, I could do that. Like if, Eddie Vedder is on stage in front of 10,000 people at a Lollapalooza or whatever. But this person and this band is on stage in front of 50 people. To me, that would be just as exciting. I don't need 50,000 people. I'll take five. You know, that's exciting to me. So let me up there. Let me get up there and do that. So, yeah, then, you know, started a band and started really trying to get up on stage and perform. Oh, my God. Mm. The Three Amigos story. What? I just told you that. Okay. Oh, yeah. That was but so I actually, good. actually, I was able to pinpoint the first time I got on stage. Dude. Um, so the very first time I got on stage was <laughs> um, the Monday after the Three Amigos came out in the theaters. Chevy Chase, Martin Short, Steve Martin. Uh, I had, my parents had taken me to the movies to see it. It broke my brain because it was so fucking funny. I didn't, I had never seen a movie that funny. I didn't realize that humor was even a fundamental element of being alive. I didn't, I didn't know that. And I was like, what is this called humor? Like, what the fuck is this? So uh, I, the next Monday or, or that weekend, sorry, after I'd seen the movie, I was playing with some friends they had also seen the movie. This is pre-internet, you know, so we didn't know that we had also, we had seen the same movie. So I found a few friends who had also seen Three Amigos and I hatched a plan um, that during lunch in the, in the elementary lunch room, there was also a stage, but there was a curtain on the stage. So when there were, you know, musicals or whatever, all the, uh, the, the lunch tables would get moved and then the chairs would go in place and there was a stage there, but the stage was always there, whether it was being used or not. So I had to plan with all my other friends who saw Three Amigos. At my cue, we were gonna put our lunches down and rush the stage and stand up there and do the Three Amigos secret handshake thing where they like, you know, it's like a, a bunch of hand gestures uh, and it's, it's synchronized. So we did it and we had the courage and we went up there and people realized that we were up there and I, I must have been like fourth no no sorry fifth grade that's great um and people realized that we were doing it and we did it and everyone laughed even the lunch monitors who we were like get ready to run because they're going to come after us but i'm willing to go to the principal's office for this so here's the plan we get up there we do as much as we can the second we see the head lunch lady come to get us off, run into the hallway, just run and just keep running and go into the men's, go into the boys' bathroom. Uh, and then we'll wait it out and see what happens. So uh, we did it. And the lunch lady was laughing. I, I clearly remember her face laughing. And I was like, this is the greatest feeling in the world. And I'm going to do everything I can to find this feeling all the time. So you got everyone on board. Life. You got everyone on board. No. One no. Yeah. Not a single no. There was, and we, I almost had to kick somebody out because there was three amigos, obviously, but there was a fourth <laughs> friend. And I was like, you can't do it with four people. It's the three amigos. It has to be us three. It was me, Peter, and Sean. And Mike Barwicky, you can cross his name out. I don't want people to dox him with him. He's like, I saw the movie too. And I was like, you can't be a fourth amigo because it's only three amigos. Um, but he was so passionate about it. Yeah. yeah. He, he was so passionate about it that I, I let him up there and, you know, we made it our own. So we were the four amigos that day and it was a great feeling. So after that, 
I subconsciously clocked that and registered it in like my soul. And then that informed a lot of my decisions moving forward later in life with music and being on stage. It's really funny um, that you mentioned like that and Steve Martin. Maynard um, from Tool basically said Steve Martin is the greatest, what the great, like he had a Mount Rushmore, it'd be Steve Martin number one. Yeah. Like, and yeah. you had this profound moment with him too, which is quite surprising and kind of nuts. Mm -hmm. And uh, how old is, is Maynard? He's got to be. 40 like late 40s you think? yeah he's got to be like 40s 50s probably like slight generation above yeah yeah he's probably my parents generation maybe Half a yeah that's a it's a random fact like it's just and okay okay so when did you see music and humor coalesce like well this is what i'm trying to figure out yeah i'm wondering if he saw the same same thing i saw but i don't think so if he's half a generation older than okay. me so it probably wasn't the no. same things that, that I went through. Well, yeah. I mean, there is, but what's crazy, nobody knows, but there really is a way to find out. Like I could find out if I wanted to right now, if Maynard watched the thing that I did that changed my life. I have, we have mutual friends, me and Maynard have mutual friends. I could literally yeah. find out. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'd be interested. Separation, it's literally two degrees. Yeah. yeah. And this is not a bragging thing yeah. by any means. What I'm saying is I'm a part of a network and I, I can network with people who know him and I could find out. Yeah. Um, but yes, I do think that Steve Martin was very important to me because he was the first adult that I saw be silly. Yeah. He, wow. he was the adult. He was adult that introduced me to a childlike silliness in evolved humor. Yes. Um, yeah. Which you bring so to that's, your work. You bring to your work. Like, the seriousness, yeah. and it's like, and that's one of the great things about your band is that you can go, like, super cathartic and super angry and super, that which I find incredibly calming. I find shouting often very calming. I'm like, you're getting out how I feel. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. But it's good to have temper with humour because that's what, hum like, life is. It's not like we haven't all laughed at a time of absolute sorrow. Like, how the hell else do we do it? Like, yeah, I mean, that's such um, that's such an important thing that has been overlooked by maybe two generations now. Yeah, I mean, it 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 really where what what happened to humor? Like, honestly, what happened? Where did it go? Um, I, I, I feel like if there is humor nowadays, it's nasty, you know, and I don't know if any of your, you or any of your listeners are aware of my Seinfeld tweet that went viral because it introduced a nasty humor to culture. And I still believe that I, I stand by my tweet a million percent. It, I, I think that for someone who was my age, I start, I didn't get into Seinfeld when it was out, yeah. but I saw my friends who did and it changed them. It made them meaner. And I think that other people had the same experience yeah, at dude. the exact same time, you know? And I, I want to find like, those people. But, but is yeah. it just a reflection of what people were, like people were self-interested, awful people, and they then got to see it like there? Not like, not that. Like when people, well, the whole kind of fundamental thing of hardcore of being on that level. And it's interesting because mm -hmm. generationally, like you go back a bit, they were like, I saw these big seventies bands. I could never be them. Then I saw Black Flag. And then I was like, I can do that. And you kind of had the next generation experience of like those big rock right. and, and that, and that inclusion. Yeah. Like, did you right. feel like you wanted to bring, what did you want to bring when you were like, yeah. Silliness. Yes. Silliness. Yeah, I mean, that's all, but I didn't know that. I only understand that now in hindsight. Yeah. I was always trying to provide the levity of silliness because I genuinely believe that things are not as bad as people make them out to be. I genuinely believe that whatever God you believe in has a really good sense of humor, is a very kind God wants us to laugh more um and i, I you whatever god you want I, I don't care if it's music or whatever anything you believe in higher power the energy. i believe that 
Yeah, energy. The I believe we are world. meant to have more. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. and that's where did all well, this lot of rah in there too? Where does that come from? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that is because that's yeah. true to me. I yeah. grew up in a in a hardcore scene. So I am trying to use my own skill set to provide levity with silliness. Yes. Um, I'm good at being a, a, a front man for a hardcore band. Yeah. I'm good at writing lyrics. I'm good at performing. And also, I'm good at not giving a fuck about any of that if I don't want to. You know, like it's all supposed to be fun. This is yes. supposed to be fun. So I'm just, I've always been trying to like, okay, I'll draw you in with the solemn, the solemnity and the sorrow and all the fucking intense shit. But when you get close to me, we're going to laugh. Like, because I don't, I'm not doing anything so severely that I've lost my sense of humor. But yeah, the truth yeah. is I did lose my sense of humor for a very long time. And I was upset about it because I knew it was gone because I had seen it vanish from pop culture. And then I felt it vanish from my soul. And I was like, this is awful. I, I, I can't laugh. If I, I'm not laughing unless like some, it's at something else's expense. Where's the true kind humor that I was born with yeah. that I held on to yeah. for so long. So um, yeah, I had lost that. And uh, then Angie came into my life and reintroduced it to me. And now I'm, I'm happier than I've ever been because I, I am serious about things I need to be serious about, but there is always a little bit of you're fucking taking yourself oh way God. too seriously <laughs> how good is like like everything happens to another person like we're tribal animals you know we're meant yeah. to like yeah. grow and develop through our connections with other people and we're not meant to be a part once upon a time we would have died once upon a time yep. if we didn't have the tribe there's no way we could have killed that wildebeest right, it, right. like that's just facts and to find that um connection whether it's like let's spare only the ones i love that's a great line like it's kind of it's basically it, that's great. It's it, and that's uh, what I I really I'm kind of understanding now. Things that were very clear to me when I was writing the record that I thought would be very clear to people yeah. when they heard the record, yeah, are not clear. So what I'm saying with that is that if you end like, and this is a very funny way of saying it, yeah. if you yeah. end up dead on judgment day it's because you weren't nice to me and i'm a good person i mean honestly that's all there is to it if you're an asshole to me it says everything about your character because i'm actually a good person and to stand opposed to that you know it means you don't actually know me so either get to know me or fuck off because it's i'm 42 you know i don't have fucking time to do the dance anymore no you know and that's yeah. all so, a reflection of their own self. <laughs> you know, yes, you can exactly. Kind of other people, as you can be kind to yourself. Like people who hate on other people, fucking hate themselves, man. That's just. Oh my god, do they ever you treat the world different to how you treat yourself? So that's kind yep. of tragic. And the last five years have been pretty weird. You know, mm. it's been a weird. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, especially for Americans. Um, yeah. And I say that not because I pity myself, um, but I say that because I have traveled, you know, to different countries and I understand how people see Americans. I understand how Americans see themselves. Yeah. Um, and yes, if you are an American at this time, it's fucking weird for you. You know, it's weird for me. I'm an American, but there are constants that we can hold to in the dark, you know, and we can use our own instinct our built-in moral compass to stay with our tribe through the darkness and trust that it will be light someday and we're gonna be standing on a new horizon with our tribe and we will survive and we made it it would be beautiful um but it's gonna take some fucking work to get there and you know a lot of it is me trying to remind people that look if it didn't work out for you in the end it's not the end like just wait trust it's gonna fucking it's gonna be good because i genuinely believe 
you know, going back to what I said before, that the higher intelligence mm. is good and it has a sense of humor and it likes laughter. You know, I think that just the sound of laughter alone, if you hear somebody laugh, let's say you're in a fucking dark room and there's a hundred other people, can't, nobody can see anybody, somebody laughs, you will hear that laugh and say, that sounds like a laugh I have when I find something truly funny. That's whoever laughed like that, they might be my friend. Then you hear a different laugh and it's a cackle and you think, ooh, that laugh made me feel like they're laughing at me. Yeah. That laugh made me feel like they already have their mind made up about a lot of things. It's, it's a very um, dismissive laugh. You know, I'm just imagining what different kind of laughs there are. Yeah. But I'm saying that you can very much identify who your friends would be by the way they laugh and the things they laugh at. Yeah. And, you know, if people are laughing at the parts in Seinfeld where they're intentionally harming someone for their own good, then those are not people that I want around me. Fuck you. That no. shit's not funny. Fuck off. Like, and I'm not ashamed to say that because you know what? Fine. You want to pretend that it's political and Republicans are the ones who laugh at bad, uh, who think that bad people are funny and Democrats are the ones who don't even fucking know what's funny. It's not political. It's the, your character, the quality yeah. of your character is indicative. I believe in your laugh. Like, yeah. And I don't know if this is a theory that can be proven, but it's worked for me. Yes. It has. It's kept me away from certain people and it has drawn me closer to people um, that I didn't understand yet were bad because I didn't know what kind of laugh I had, if that makes sense. That is pretty wild, dude. Like the, the level of um, depth we can pick up in our, and especially in a time where we aren't doing all that nonverbal communication, like the tone of the laugh, like we're spending yep. time not being able to read people's laughs. Loves. Yeah. Third words. Do you yeah, remember yeah. you made a whole, like, a whole show laugh with you? Because there's um, that every time. There's got to be laughs at a show. I, yeah, I don't remember the first. I, yeah, I don't remember the first time. But yeah. I do remember that I used to actively try, like, I, I'm not lying. Like, I would work in comedy bits. Like, stuff I had written between songs and see if the jokes landed you know so i was always trying to get people to laugh because when they laugh they're disarmed and then if they're disarmed they're open to goodness you know it's it's bad if you're a bad person and you open a bunch of people up to you and then you take advantage of them you know i don't dis i don't get people to laugh so they disarm themselves so i go up oh, got Snatched it, got what's good. No, I'm saying, hey, open up and then we'll laugh and then it'll be great and everyone will feel not angry anymore. Um, that was just something I try to have as like an undercurrent through the set. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I don't remember the first time, but I do know that it, it was always, I've always consciously done it. Yeah. Well, then you kind of open people up to catharsis. It's like when you, yeah, it's like when you, when someone tries to cheer you up, and you get into a laugh and then you can kind of talk about the, the heavy shit, you know? Yeah. And you know, what's crazy too is, um, this might be a little bit of a tangent, but uh, I've been watching, you know, but Angie and I've been watching a ton of Disney movies, obviously, but I, we, you know, I, I have a five-year-old daughter who six. has six now <laughs> as of yesterday, she's six. I don't want to get you in trouble yeah. if she hears uh -huh. this. She, her and Angie have developed a very, very, very strong, unique bond. Um, you know, because Angie's not her biological mother, but she's very much her, I, I call it like an astral mother or a, a spiritual mother, you know, logical family, not biological family, logical family, the family. logical family. There you go. There you go. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Logical family. So, um, we've been watching a lot of Disney movies and I've had that theory about laughter for a while. Yeah. It's become something that I've fairly recently maybe within the last year or two it's been something that i've actually been able to put into words and and look for now you know it was always something i was kind of doing subconsciously but now that i understand what it is now i'm looking for it yeah. um so in these disney movies 
you know, you actually will see that a lot. You'll see little kids walking up to the scariest monster and making them laugh. That is the tactic. That's the tactic to disarm the most evil, the most dangerous. It's just get them to laugh. That's all you got to do. So uh, that's very apparent in a lot of Disney movies, that Raya the Dragon, uh, most currently and prominently in my brain. Yeah. Is when you know, a little girl walks up to like the big scary guy in the boat. I think she tickles him or something. I'm like, oh, that's another way, great way to get a laugh. That's really cute. It's a childlike way to disarm the evil adults, you know? Um, yeah. Who musically does this for you? Who makes you laugh your ass off? Or is this something that exists outside of music? And this is just something you bring to It's not something that exists outside of music, but it's definitely something that doesn't exist outside of rap. Yeah. I mean, Honestly, rap and hip hop are the only times that I've listened to lyrics like that's fucking really good. That's really fucking smart. That's really fucking that's funny, but in a smart way. You know what I mean? Like, the, I just feel like with hip hop lyrics and rap lyrics, like it's just a different. The the culture of hip hop and rap understands it more, I think, than the culture of punk and hardcore. Do you think that's um, what the like the fundamental like basis of it like so many people talk about minor threat like so many and ian mckay is pretty serious mckay yeah it's pretty serious uh, yeah. man. if you get right down to hardcore it's kind of serious in some ways it's, it's all too it's way too serious yeah I mean, look at everything it's too serious like we were playing in uh orlando or miami the other night and uh and general like walking down the street to the venue and it was a street with a ton of clubs and they were all packed all of them, all of them had, they were packed. There were lines on the door. We were trying to count how many people we saw smiling, zero. Miami. Miami, yeah. Yes. We had zero. We were looking like, find, show me someone who's smiling. No show way. me someone. And we're like, oh my God, no one is smiling. Because no one. Because everyone had an agenda. Yeah, because everyone has their own agenda. They're not interested in a community. They're interested in going into a location finding something valuable and stealing it for the night you know what's it when 10 people died i was just watching and going where is the pit etiquette and hospitality i was like that wouldn't happen in our world like it just it wouldn't would happen. it broke my heart i was just like what has happened to these people like what do you well, not understand the fundamental principle of music and like connection and being in a room together what are your thoughts maybe they don't but they they might not because okay. the the, the artist might not have ever introduced them to it. You know, like yeah. Travis Scott, amazing. I, 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 this is such an unfortunate fucking incident that happened. It's, it's yeah. terrible and it will change the way things are done for the better. Yes. I don't feel like he understood who his crowd was, but you can't when it's that big. That's a good point. How do you understand anything? Like the people that come to every time at I shows have pit etiquette. Absolutely. But if you put, even the biggest every time at I show at a Travis Scott arena <laughs> and then filled it up with everybody else, even the people that did know would get trampled. So it's too big, it's too much. And it's a shame that he didn't understand that. Prior. Yeah. It's a he shame that he point. didn't understand his relationship with his crowd. Yeah. Because if he understood who his crowd was, that might not have happened, you know? And the teaching thing is a big deal. Like even actually even going back to hip hop, like if someone was talking about it, I things like Snoop Dogg or something is talking about how just taking what we know and passing it on to the next generation, like in terms of the culture and what the role and function of music is and what, what's important to this culture and this music and stuff. Do you feel like you had any mentors in terms of what the fundamental principles are or like on your own record? No, yeah. You had to kind of make yeah, it no. kind of a young music. But yeah. Part of. Like this is quote, right? Okay. Whenever an art form loses its fire, when it gets weakened by intellectual inbreeding and first principles fade into stale tradition, a radical fringe eventually appears to blow it up and rebuild it from the rubble. Like lost generation writers in the 20s, beat poets in the 50s, and rock musicians in the 60s. I think this was written a while ago. They were poor mm -hmm. and ignored and free from all expectations and inhibitions. They were body artists playing. Yep of human endurance mm -hmm. has that happened to heart like has this happened to your music when did it happen and 
what do you think there's been radical movements is that too is that too thinky no yeah uh, no no no. it's not too thinky um it, it definitely hasn't happened but it needs to fucking happen yeah it needs to happen now and our album radical needs to be the cohesive fucking water cooler that people gather around and talk in front of it's it i want radical just radical doesn't have to do anything except be a fucking campfire for people to sit around and talk that's all it needs to be because oh. once they get there they will discover they are powerful they will discover they're good and they will move forward together that's all i care about i'm not saying like yo you guys need to see this enemy and do, and uh, eradicate that no i'm saying hey I fucking guarantee that if you figure out who you are and you connect with other good people, all of this awful shit will go away. It might not be in our lifetime, but if you're selfless and you love other people, it doesn't have to be in your lifetime. You yeah. can die with the knowledge that it's carried on, you know? That's a really, that's a really big goal. It's a really good album. Like it's just, it is. Yeah. Like it's really Why shouldn't good. I have that goal for it? Why, I knew it was a good album. It's because sick. Like, I've been writing, sick. I've been writing every time at ISOS for 20 years. Yeah. So I know that this is a good album. Yeah. And I know that the fucking time is needed for someone to say, okay, you know what? I don't know what's going on, but let's start right here. If you like every time at I and you have this album, you're seen. I see you. You guys see each other. Let's fucking figure it out. Yeah. You know? Like start now with this record. How do you see your people? Yeah, um, you I see people? them. I I I, I see them be watching. as I. Was that? They'll be watching. Your people. Uh yeah, I, I see them as a very very passionate, imaginative, wise, trusting, loving group of individuals that want to help as much as they want to be helped Whoa. which the conditions are perfect then to just introduce them to each other hey you you guys like every time and i over here in fucking cleveland ohio you should talk to some of the people over here in detroit because they have the same political conditions you have right now yeah. and they like the same things how can you guys team up to come up with something you know yeah. uh, it doesn't matter just i just want anyone who likes us to find each other. I don't give a fuck about me or the record or the band. I really don't. Radical is out there. I'm just trying to, like I said, campfire. If you guys yeah. want to gather around it, it's all yours. We need the campfire. The campfire. Yeah, we do. The, camp, the campfire is the most ancient. Telling stories is the thing that makes us different to apes, even if like yep. we're genetically not that different. Uh, mm -hmm. I say that and I don't know whether apes are telling mad stories and we just don't understand. There's every chance. So Well, Planet of the Apes was written by an ape, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So like I shouldn't really question yeah. apes. Yeah, right. Question apes. But there's <laughs> no. There's yeah, I mean there's something idealistic and I like I guess it's a blend of being idealistic and realistic and you're not very pessimistic, like even in the dark parts. Like, no, I, I've never been. I've never been. That's what I need. I want people to understand is that like, well, I, I hope they understand, but I, I feel they, they will just by looking at all the proof I've laid out for 20 years is that there is beauty in everything. Yeah. And if I'm angry at all, it's because other people aren't letting people like me see it, you know? I'm a human being. I have a right to see beauty in every moment that I'm alive and other people are my fucking way, you yeah. know, and because they're awful people and they don't want me to see it. And I don't understand. Why don't you want me to see it? It's yours too. Like you don't have to be standing in front of me, fucking pushing me away from it. Turn around. Let's all look at it together. Like there's a lot of good oh, shit yeah. here. Let's look at the fire and the light and stuff. Last night, it's because there's that or the mad. Yes. So Sorry, hold that, on one second. I'm being that, reminded. That was a really good talk that we had yeah. about how if people are sad, mm -hmm. they don't want to yeah. look at you because you make them sad. Yeah. If they're, you know, the sad yeah. and the mad thing. It's, it's it's something has happened very unexpectedly on this tour um, yeah. to me that I've been talking to Angie about, um, and I, I I feel like I am the best version of myself I've ever been 
I know there's still some, I, I feel like there's work to do, obviously, but I'm growing. So I'm healing, I'm growing. But <clears throat> there is something that I've noticed that's happening on, on tour with other people, where if Angie and I are together, people either don't talk to us or feel or, or come to us very like it's sad. They're always approaching us sadly. I'm like, why are the people that are coming up to us and talking to us after a show, why do they either look angry from a distance or why are they coming up and they're sad? And <clears throat> I feel. Oh. oh, wait, there's a third. There's a third. I, I, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. I just don't I'm want. Not interrupting. I just don't want to. It's such a good point. I don't want it to do, do it an injustice by leaving this out. Your fans and your people are happy to yeah. see us yeah but then the people who are not your fans right. who are there for you know various different reasons mm -hmm. if we encounter them mm -hmm. they are usually either stoked yeah. to meet us mm -hmm. because they're happy with themselves yeah or they're sad or mad right and then that you're yeah. discussing those two things yeah. i just want to make sure that you're right. She knew that there was the majority of people are fucking stoked to meet yes, us. Yeah. And very happy. Right. So, I, yeah, I was trying to figure out what it was about the other people that I didn't really have a conversation with yet, yeah. that I haven't really connected with yet. What is it about them that it, it, there's such a disparity between us, whereas other people on the tour, I'm getting along with very well, you know? It's um, so weird, dude. It's <laughs> It's just what's resonating with what's like the frequency of right. Like, so okay, so that's you're vibrating on a you're clearly from a place of connectedness. Okay, so I've got a friend who's into Aikido, which is like a Japanese form of martial art, and he talks about right. two things that men and women are well, I'm sorry if I'm not catering to all genders, but men and women, this is an old ancient thing. Men we'll and we'll say masculine and feminine energy. Masculine, feminine energy, whoever, however you fit in, in that men mm. give. Um, just for the pure act of it, men give sexual energy and women absorb it. And women often yeah. give emotional energy and men absorb it. And if you're in a really good partnership, those circuits get stronger and stronger and stronger. Yes. And you almost have an aura around you of that connection. Yes. And that's actually oh my God. Yeah. Being alive. But that's actually one of the whole points of being alive. Yes, it has a biological yes. experience on some level. We don't have to act on that. But like, and I think if you have that really strong circuit, people who aren't, who are cut off from that circuit are going to be like, fuck you. Like, kind of yeah, level, totally. like I, I like, I can't, I'm not even on the circuit, man. You're I'm right. Online. Like, yes, you're right. You know? And it's strange because I, I, we, I, I can't, I, there, in no way do I intend to, push anyone away so they're pulling back for a reason that i don't understand yeah it's energy. and i'm trying to yeah trying to yeah. figure it out it's so weird like it, but it is that like it is if you're operating on a higher frequency it's confronting if you're not and um and it's really cool for you to talk about so much about like and you do on the album about our inner worlds and just how much it's all just reflection we're all just broadcasting yeah. what's going on behind here yeah and it's yeah so you you better know what what is behind there yeah and the all you know the the only way that i feel to fully understand who you are is to give all of yourself to someone you trust and see what they do with it you yeah. know find the person that you love the most that you trust the most give them everything yeah. and see what they do because they're either going to gather it together and look at it and be like okay, we got this together. Or they're going to be like, what is it? What do you mean? And then you go, what do you mean? What do I mean? And then you realize there's a disconnect and you go, oh, we're not supposed to be together. Okay. We're yeah. not supposed to be together. Yeah. Stride gently away because the connection isn't there and let's not even, okay. I've got a really random question for you. Like um, you talked about nine inch nails before. This is a real weird side note, but I'll come back. Like it is related, right? Like, okay. uh, yeah. Yeah, you talked about Nine Inch Nails in an old interview I watched or whatever, right? And like Closer is the most interesting visual treatment of that song that could have possibly yeah. happened. It is the most left field, obtuse. So many people would have handled that song in such an obvious, lame-ass way. And that is like one of the most interesting 
artistic things. With some song like a song like Sex, 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 which is in some ways about trust, what is the weirdest thing you could do with a music video around these kind of topics that maybe could be interpreted as in a certain way? That's really weird, but. No, but I, I have an answer. I, I think the strangest thing I could do would be to uh, find a director that represented everything literally. You yeah. know, I think that there's a lot of, there's so much imagery in, in, in the lyrics because I'm trying to find ways to make them applicable to different people. Yeah, and I'm, deeper. Yeah. Yeah. Someone yeah. Knows. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm, it's a lot of, I'm trying to find the myth, the mythologies that people will, will relate to, you know, and, and show the similarities between our strife personally and internally and these mythological characters that you can look to for, I don't know, uh, uh, not advice, but inspiration, because these are myths. They're in place to inspire, you know, generation after generation. So yeah. a lot of it's myth making and, and fucking with myths. Yeah. But I think I yeah. would love to see someone take what I did, did uh, what I wrote and represent it literally. And as I'm saying that, I realize I did that with Underwater Bimbo Sermona Space. So, okay. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I already did that. So never mind. Yeah, that's fine. But it's okay. Well, what's a myth that you that's meaningful to you? What what mythical creatures do you or do you look to? What who do you think kind of embodies ideals that you look up to? Or is there none of them? None. None of them. You got to create and your I'll own. I'll tell you why. I'll, I'll make my own, and I'll tell you why. Because every fucking hero tale ends with the hero doing the thing on their own, and then being reunited with the ones they love. Yeah. That is not how a hero completes his journey or her journey. A yeah. hero takes the people they love and goes on the hero journey together. There's no reunition. Or re reunification. <laughs> reunification. I say re you invented a word. Also, Sorry. also, I have said that word to my daughter because she understands it better that way. Okay. So there's no reunification. Um, it's just you're, you're, you're with the people you love the entire time. Yeah. That's, and, and then it's a happy ending, but nobody wants to see that. Nobody believes that life is good all the way through, yeah. you know, and it's not, there are ups and downs, yeah. but ultimately it trends towards goodness, you know? That's so, so cool. You've kind of gone through the peaks and the valleys and you're in a, a peaky plateau kind of thing. Like it feels like it's going to mm -hmm. go like you, you're in a peaky plateau, like a like a peaky moment of life. Uh, yeah, I feel peaky. Yeah. How peaky. do you how do you um how do you handle the blank page when you're feeling connected in this way to other people and to the world? Is it easier? Does there, the blank page I, I, there is no blank page. I am the blank page. I, I, there is no blank page in front of me. It's I, I'm it. So it's, it's really? amazing. Yeah, well, yeah. It, I mean. You know, in the same way that fatalism versus free will is existing, you know, it's, it is written, but it's not, you know, 